Hey everyone, I'm Mike Sattel, and in this video I want to talk about the March SAT. What did you think about it? Specifically, was it much harder than the practice test? This is what the feedback is I'm getting from my students, from people who comment on my channel. Uh, so I did not take the test. I have no first-hand knowledge of this. This is just feedback from other people. Um, but I do want to talk about some theories that could explain why it felt harder and whether it actually was. One thing I will say right off the bat, though, is remember that in each module, two of the questions do not count towards your score. They're just experimental questions that the SAT is using to test out new ideas and new concepts. So it's possible that the, the things that were really hard and weird were just stuff that didn't even count. So um, what I'm getting, though, is that there's probably more than two questions, especially in that hard math module, that threw people off. So it's, it's probably not just that. So let's talk about some things that it could be. But also, if you've got theories, put them in the comments and share your, your experience with other people who might be taking the test in May or June. So theory number one is that, yes, maybe this test was genuinely harder than the practice test, but the curve would be more lenient, meaning you can get more questions wrong and still do very well. And this is actually what I predicted in my other video about the March SAT. So if this is the case, then hooray for me. But um, this, is, this could be the case because it would basically solve a long-term problem that the SAT has had, which is that at the top of the scoring scale, like you're 700 and above in a subject, it gets very hard for them to distinguish between the different levels. So it used to be the case on old versions of the SAT that if you just got one wrong in math, your score could drop from an 800 all the way down to a 770 or even 760. Or if you got two wrong, then it would go down to like a 740, 730, 720, I think one time way back in the early aughts actually was the, the scoring scale, which is insane because what they want to be able to do is tell people apart. And if just the difference between one question wrong and two questions wrong is 80 points, you're not telling anybody anything useful. The college is not understanding how uh, that person's ability is reflected by the test because that's just like bad luck at a certain point. So what uh, the adaptive testing lets them do is kind of figure this out more easily and kind of start to separate and say that someone who gets a 770 is very different from someone who gets a 740. It's a difference of maybe four or five questions. And so that is a measurable difference. So that could be what is happening. So they might be making these hard modules so hard knowing that a lot of people are going to get a lot wrong, but also that that still could keep you in the 700s. It's just the way that the system is going to work out. So we don't know yet. We won't know until I think March 22nd when the scores come back. But one thing I am curious about is if you thought that this math module was harder did you take blue book SAT number four because that one I think is also very hard and I'm curious how that math module compares to the real thing um, to me some of the other practice tests might be on the easier side but this SAT number four was very difficult and had a lot of weird quirky questions but also the scaling of that section was enough that you could get more questions wrong and still do very well so another thing we could ask about is if you took the March SAT and then you also took it internationally one of the tests in the fall, right? So the digital SAT has been international for a year. So I'll be curious if this March SAT seemed any different from the December or other fall uh, international SAT exams. Theory number two, though, is that this is all in your head. Okay, so sometimes this is just the way it is, is that it feels really hard on test day because you were nervous. And honestly, based on my experience with my own students, this is probably the most likely thing. Uh, and the old SAT, they used to release what they called QAS exams. So certain SATs throughout the year, the SAT would let you purchase the test, and about a month or two after you got your, uh, after you took the test, you would get your scores back, but you'd also get the actual test questions that you had and the answers that you put. So a lot of my students would say, oh my God, Mike, this test was so hard, it was harder than anything we ever done, I'd never seen half of this stuff before. I'd be like, okay, sure, sure, uh, let's see, let's wait and see. And um, sure enough, we would get the test questions back and I'd go through it with them. I'd be like, this is all stuff we did. This is the exact same question that you saw, or this twist is the same, or um, more likely that these the strategies that I know I taught you could have worked. And so what ends up happening though is when people take the real test, they some people get very nervous and they panic and that kind of fight or flight response kicks in. Now I think it kicks in for everybody, but some of us are more in the fight mentality, just like if like a tiger came out of the bush and you were a caveman, like you, some people are gonna like try to fight off the tiger, other people are gonna run. And so on the SAT, even though it's a very different scenario, your brain is you know evolved to have these two responses. 
And if you are fighting back against the SAT, then your, your focus is higher. You have more mental energy and endurance and you know, you're physically stronger and be able to sit through that test. So that's one fight response that you could have. But if you have a flight response, then you might just panic and start second guessing everything that you do and not use the strategies that you've learned. And so try to think if you thought that this test was harder, does it feel like you were fighting against the test or did it feel like you were running from the test? Because I do think that that impacts how you answer the questions. So try to have more of a fight response. You can control this. And I do recommend that when you take practice tests, you try to make yourself nervous so that you can practice what that feels like so that you're not changing anything from the practice test to the real test. You want that experience to feel the same. Theory number three, though, is a little bit more nuanced. So it's possible that the test was not any harder, but uh, there are always these kind of twisted questions on the exam, and maybe these twists were new to you and you didn't really know how to respond to them. So the, the reason that might have happened is if you practiced a lot, ironically, you might have accidentally spoiled the practice test in lots of ways that made those twisted questions less weird and, and more predictable to you. And that, that kind of affects it because the practice test then you kind of knew what you were doing, whereas the kind of very same number of twisted questions on the, uh, the real test wouldn't have been predictable to you. They would have been new. And so when I say a twisted question, that's basically what the SAT does when they take something very straightforward, like um, solving for X or here's how to use a semicolon. And they twist it up. They create a weird sentence or a very weird equation or add in some constants and variables and other other things and then suddenly it doesn't look like it's solved for X anymore. Suddenly it doesn't look like it's just about the semicolon rules. It is and some people are really good at untwisting the question and getting it back to the basics but other people are not. And so what could have happened is if you had some spoilers for these practice tests, you had those twists untwisted for you before you took the test. So let me talk about what that might mean because I think that's very important if you are looking to take the test again that you don't make the same mistake twice. So first of all, uh, if you took any of those linear S exams, those non-adaptive PDF college board exams, those are bad. Those are not part of the way that the real uh, exam is gonna be given. Plus, even one of those linear tests gives you uh, questions from all of the Blue Book adaptive tests. And so you're, if even just one of those is spoiling all those Blue Book exams in even just a little bit. So now maybe like 10, 20% of the questions on the adaptive test, I've already, you've already seen them. So you're obviously gonna do better because you know the answers or at least you know how to solve. And so you're quicker. So that's a big problem and that's the College Board's fault. They should never have released those exams. But the fault of uh, the spoiling things also lies a little bit on some other YouTubers. Uh, I'm not gonna name names, but I do know that a lot of these like quick tips and tricks to get a 1600 videos are just taking video, uh, taking questions from those practice tests, those blue book practice tests and just giving them to you without warning you, hey, I'm spoiling the test. And so you're just kind of, you think you're learning something that you're gonna use in all sorts of places, but really they're just telling you how to solve a very hard question. So that when you got to that question on the practice test, you already knew how to solve it. It wasn't a twisted hard question for you, but obviously then the real test is gonna have completely different questions. So you didn't learn how to untwist those. So that's a real problem. And one thing I will say is uh, my channel will never, ever, ever do this. All of the questions from the Blue Book tests are labeled in the thumbnail, in the title, in the description. So it's very clear that that is a spoiler for one of the practice exams. So if you see that, then yeah, don't do that question unless you've done that exam. But if you watch any of my other lessons, they are either gonna be questions from the question bank that are not on the, uh, the, the practice test, or they're gonna be things that I created that are completely original that will, again, not spoil the practice test. That is my promise to you, always on my channel, you will know that you are not spoiling the valuable practice tests. Um, the question bank though, like I said, is from the College Board, and this is something also that could have spoiled the practice test for you. I've talked about this before. Basically, the College Board stupidly put all of the practice test questions in that question bank. So if you were just going through that, you would have seen the questions and then seen them on the practice test, and of course, that's gonna inflate your score and make you think you did better. Now, the other piece here, this, this softeners thing, this is a little bit more tricky. Basically, this is a problem that comes from having a new exam, a, a test we don't have a lot of resources. So we only have four practice tests, we only have a handful of other questions, and what a lot of tutors are doing is just kind of using those materials to write new questions so that they can give you original stuff that doesn't spoil the practice test. And for some topics, that's fine, right? Like if it is a very basic solve for X question or a very basic semicolon question, it doesn't really matter that we're looking at the material from the college board and using that to come up with new stuff. Those rules don't change. They are very straightforward. 
But if it's a twisted question and we kind of just copy that, and I've, I've been guilty of this, I try not to be, but if we just kind of copy that twist, then give you a, what we say is a new question, but we just like change the numbers, then you solve that. And then when you see a similar question on the test, you think, ah, I've memorized how to solve this. I can do this. A classic example to me is the, um, if you did take practice test number four, you might remember the surface area prism question. I won't say any more because I don't want to spoil it for those people who haven't taken that, but you know what I'm talking about. It is a very weird geometry question, and there's a very specific way to solve it. So if you saw a copy of that question on an unofficial, in an unofficial book, a practice test site, a, a course, or some sort of AI-powered question bank, if you saw a copy of that question with different numbers, then you took practice test four and saw that question again, you would at least have a foundation to build off of and know kind of how to solve that. And now that really weird question that would have taken you maybe like four or five minutes is suddenly, I don't know, half that time. And that's not good because you're never gonna see that question again on a real test. It's just a practice test question. They're gonna come up with other weird ways to twist up prisms and surface area and all sorts of topics. So we have to be prepared for the unpredictable stuff. And if you are studying the predictable stuff, that's great, but it's when you start to make those weird twisted questions seem like they're predictable that people can think that the practice tests are really easy, but then get to the real test and be surprised by things. You should be surprised by things in the real test. It will always have questions you've never seen before. And that's why I'm such a, a stickler for strategies. I think it's not enough to just memorize steps and processes for these questions. You need strategies that you can kind of pull out of a toolbox no matter what the question is, because you will get things that are surprising to you and you need to have lots of ways to potentially solve that question. So um, just be careful. Uh, this is exactly why you know AI powered stuff really scares me because, not because it's, it's gonna take over the world, but because they're just, you're just feeding it thousands of SAT questions. What's it gonna do? It's gonna produce identical SAT questions. It's not going to give you the variety that a real SAT would, and you need to be practicing on that. So I always try to give you new kinds of twists, but it is a challenge when we have a new test and limited resources is that we don't know how much unpredictable stuff there's going to be. So just something to keep in mind as you practice. Um, as you think about when the, the scores will come back on the 22nd, but as you think about what you're gonna do next, if you do um, have any advice or people who are going to take the test later, or if you have things that you, you wish you had known for this first test, please put in the comments, share. What do you think? Was the March SAT actually harder? Does one of my theories sound correct to you? Do you have your own theory? Basically anything that you have for feedback on the test could be helpful to me in making new resources or other people who are going to take the exam. And my promise to you, like I said earlier, is I will never ever spoil the practice test questions in my lessons. I will always clearly label them. So you can always count on that for my channel. So please make Make sure that you subscribe and watch and like my videos so that I can continue to make more. Because when it comes to your scores, don't settle for less, so tell for more. Thanks for watching.